So I love Denton. Um, anybody with me on that? Okay, cool. Our little city uh, is tucked up here out of the frenzy of Dallas and the limelight of Austin. This beautiful, funky, creative, historic community in which everything is here. Uh, where Weldon's Boot Shop is just down the street from Harvest House. You can come get your boots while you get your kombucha there. Um, there's music, and there's art, and there's life, and there's universities, and ice cream, and community everywhere you turn, where our bars are built around picnic tables and not pickup lines most of the time, <laughs> where one week we have a pride parade downtown, and the next week we have a 4th of July parade, and that July parade, um, somebody just drove an excavator right down the middle like it was a float and made my son very, very, very happy. <laughs> and then the next float had a Jeep that was full of the Denton Christian Women's Interracial Fellowship that helped us long ago integrate this city and our school system and made Denton what it is, and that made us all happy. I love Denton. And you may be new here. You may be from, a, live in a surrounding locale, or you might just be here for undergraduate, so like four to six, seven years or so. <laughs> but we all appreciate this city, don't we? But there's this, there's this whisper, this urge, this call that we can hear that's there to do more than just appreciate this place. Even more to be a part of the fabric of this city and this community to help it grow and flourish and help the people here grow and flourish as well. And so it begs a question of us. What are we supposed to be doing with our time here? How do we love this city that stirs our hearts? Are we just to be living like tourists here, you know, kind of seeing the sights and sampling the food and taking what we can from our time here? Or are we called to something more in our time in this place to give and to build, to invest and to love? And even more, it's a question for us as a community of faith, like open, what are we doing here? We who sit near the square of Denton, near the heart of this city, in the direction that our neighbors are looking for life and meaning and community and purpose and coffee. What should we be doing here? How do we love our city? So historically, communities of faith have had these different postures that they've adopted toward the culture and the city around them. Um, some of them were just kind of in the city, right? They were there, but they were kind of apathetic and detached, doing their own thing, escaping from the community, not really paying attention to the needs or the dreams or the beauty of the people around them. Other places historically were, were of the city, conforming entirely to the constructs and the consumerism and the calcified status quo of the place where they are so that there was no space for vision or for a voice for renewal and transformation of the places where they were. Or other faith communities were against the city, seeing themselves as antagonists in opposition to the culture around them. And I know that's really hard to believe in this day where not every bumper sticker is a positive message, right? Or not every word from churches has been kind, and not every dude with a bullhorn in the middle of campus is shouting encouraging words to the students as they go by, although they totally should. I think we should start a movement of encouraging words with bullhorns out there. Good luck on your test, everyone. Have a good day. You can do it. So if you've experienced that kind of againstness or seen uh, Christian places that have done that, I I'm so incredibly sorry because God calls us in our relationship to the places where we are to something so much more, something so different and purposeful and intentional and good and beautiful and right in the city and in whatever places where we find ourselves, our God calls us to be for the city. To be for the city, to be for the community where we are. To use our time here, our gifts here, our place here, our voice here. To be on the side of our neighbor, to seek justice and equity, empowerment and beauty and inclusion and the holistic flourishing 
to love our neighbors in our neighborhoods, in our neighborhood schools, and even our neighborhood associations, even though that's hard sometimes. <laughs> to be for our city just as our God is for our city and for our world, because God describes God's posture toward the world like this. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, to be against it, but in order that the world might be saved through him to be for us, for our salvation, for our healing, for our renewal, for our flourishing. And just in the same way that God is for us and for our world, we're called to be for our city as well. So I want to share with you a section of scripture that has been really transformative to me in my vision of, of the places where I am and what God calls me to do in those places, for me and for my family as well. And I, and I hope for us as we listen to this over the next few weeks, that we can hear this voice and this call and this dream that God has for us, for our purpose, for our work, for our life here, and the way we, as a community of faith, can love our neighbors and live in our city, in the places where we find ourselves, to be people for our city. So we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 29. If you've got a copy of scripture, you can turn there this morning. But first, a little bit of context in this. Uh, we're listening into the book of Jeremiah, which was written to the people of Israel during one of the most consequential and even traumatic seasons in its history in 587 BCE. Uh, the remaining kingdom of Israel, called Judah, uh, had been conquered by Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. And as was Babylon's strategy, a section of its people, especially its young leaders, its artisans, its priests, were carried away with their families into exile and brought to live in the city of Babylon, which was a city that symbolized everything that Israel was not. And if you've heard of the book of Daniel, this is kind of the context that the book of Daniel happens in as well. And there were many voices among Israel telling them how to live in that particular time from their leadership. There were some that were saying, fight against the city. Others that said, just camp out outside and never engage. Keep yourself separate. Or, as Babylon hoped, come in and assimilate and disappear into the masses. Israel could not wait to get out, and they could not even imagine interacting with the city and the people of the city. And so there was this question, here we are, how do we live in this time? What do we do here in this city in which we find ourselves? And so here amongst that context is the word that God spoke through Jeremiah. These are the words of, beginning in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1, it says, These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And we skip ahead to verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Boom. <laughs> God says, settle down, dig in, make this your home, plant a garden, build a house, raise a family, and seek the welfare of the city before the city. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And that is just an amazing message of God. And when Jeremiah posted this on the cuneiform Facebook of the day, there were a bunch of reactions, not a lot of likes, a lot of angry faces and wow faces, because it was just mind-blowing to them. It would have been mind-blowing to them if God had said, uh, be in peace with the people around you. That would have been mind-blowing. But no, God says even more than that, seek the welfare of the city. And so it's even more amazing when we realize kind of what's behind this English translation. 
In this version, we trans- translate welfare, which is, is good, but the word in Hebrew for welfare was shalom, shalom, which, as we mentioned, as we studied James last week, uh, this word is a word we often translate peace, but it really means so much more than the absence of conflict. Um, it means more than yoga on the beach. It even means more than like just having time to Netflix and veg. Shalom meant universal, holistic flourishing. Universal, holistic flourishing. Flourishing in all areas of human existence, spiritually, socially, creatively, educationally, environmentally, economically, physically, relationally. Shalom, universal, holistic flourishing is life as God intended it. And so the people who'd just been conquered, taken from their home, resettled in a new land, placed in a new city, God says to them, seek the universal, holistic flourishing of this city and the people of it, a place where you find yourself. And so how much more does God speak that to us in this time for our place? Because here's the thing, God's hope for humanity is not limited to borders. It's not defined by a location or a nation or a church or denomination. It is for all creation, for all humanity. It is unlimited and universal. It is for all people, no matter what. And the heart of God speaks this in Psalm 145, 9. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. God wishes that all would flourish as God created them to flourish. Life as God intends. And so right here in Denton, in this city, we find ourselves surrounded by a city that God loves, by people that God loves, that God created, who God built to flourish, people whom God is for. And we are called to be for them as well. And the crazy part of that whisper that we hear from God is this invitation to play a part in that. That maybe, just maybe, the God who loves you, informs you, and knows you, maybe that God has plans for you here. Maybe God has something more in mind for your time in Denton, that it be more than just a season of passing through or a life on the periphery, enjoying some of the cool things, keeping it a bit weird from time to time, but never digging in. Maybe, just maybe, God has something more in mind for our time here, for your life here, for our community of faith here in Denton, that we be about more than just ourselves, that we seek the holistic flourishing of this city, the spiritual, social, creative, educational, economic, environmental, physical, relational flourishing and in that, that we might find our flourishing as well. This is an invitation to you, no matter who you are or where you are, what field you are working in. God calls us to dig in, make this place our home, and seek the shalom of this place. So how do we even start (laughs) that? I think God's message is simple. God simply says, start where you are with what you have. In the same way that God said to those people, even in exile, God has a a plan for you and a purpose for you where you are with what you have. I think God has something for us and for you to do here in this city. So God speaks to us who are artists among us. Don't just live off the creativity of this place, but give life through creativity. Seek renewal, create beauty, tell us stories that inspire us and call us to be more. Pour into younger artists and empower them so that they might flourish too. Be for them. For people in the financial world, seek the economic flourishing of this place. Use your position to help the community prosper. Invest, contribute, give back. Be for us. Teachers, (laughs) Seek your student and your staff's flourishing. You do it educationally. You work to develop the minds of students, and it helps them be who God built them to be. 
but along the way, you have such an opportunity to love them and to seek the flourishing of their whole lives, to be for them. Construction workers, seek the flourishing of your project and especially of your crew. Servers and cooks, cashiers, <laughs> you can bring joy and hospitality and life to this city like few else can. And kids, you may be counting down the days until you get out of the house. Your parents may be counting down the days, too. <laughs> it might feel like exile here in this time, but I tell you, and we all have those seasons, uh, adults too, where we are looking ahead beyond the present moment. But as the great prophet John Lennon said, <laughs> life is what happens when you're busy making plans, right? Well, God has a purpose for your life a plan for your life right now to seek the flourishing of this place, the flourishing of your family or the chess club or the cafeteria table, wherever you are, be for them. And together here in Open, I want to make this commitment to you. We are in this together. We want to be for you as you seek shalom in our world. If God is laying a dream on your heart and we can help, let us know. <laughs> We're for you to. So as we start where we are, as we use what we have, the posture God invites us to is that of a servant. Because if God calls us to be for the city, God calls us to be for others. That means we're coming to serve, not to look after our own interests, but to seek after the interest and the needs of others. That means we can't be afraid to dig in, to get our hands dirty, to take a small unseen role, to be patient in our work. Whatever it takes, whatever it means to be for someone else. Being servants means that we need to listen to those around us so we can know how to be on their side. Being a servant means listening to others. So in a few weeks, we're going to talk about praying for our city. And between now and then, we're endeavoring to listen to the places where we are, um, to, to take prayer requests from our city. And so we're, we're listening to students and receiving their prayer requests. We're reaching out to local restaurants and asking, how can we pray for you? To our Muslim brothers and sisters here in town, to the LGBTQ community, we're simply asking, how can we pray for you? And I want to encourage you as you go through your time over these next few weeks, if you have a chance, do the same thing. Uh, as you're out with coworkers or your neighbors or any groups that you interface with, ask them. And we would love to join you, and so you can send an email to forthecity at opendtx.com and let us know how we can join you in praying for them. It's amazing. Crystal and I were out at lunch this past week and just talking to the cashier who I've kind of built a relationship with and said, hey, we want to we wanna pray for you. And the look on her face was one of just such joy and support and real authentic hope that someone might be praying for her. Come as a servant, dig in, listen up, and serve. The third thing is this, as we go, God calls us to seek shalom. Whenever you're at work for that universal flourishing, for opportunity and equity and justice and beauty, and empowerment and reconciliation and spiritual renewal in our world, helping someone be who they were built to be, you are about the work of God. You're joining in that and seeking shalom. And in our day, that is so incredibly needed. In light of this past week and what we saw in Charlottesville and we've seen in countless other places, where we've seen clearly where violent rhetoric, and racism and bigotry and division leads, seeking shalom means standing up for each other and showing up for each other, especially the vulnerable. Pursuing peace with justice and letting the loving heart of God be lifted up high in all we do and all we say and all we seek. The heart of God that, that Paul expressed in Galatians chapter 3 like this, there's no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So I want to I show you a picture from yesterday in Charlotte. Uh, this is some clergy brothers and sisters in Charlottesville who formed a human chain of protection to keep the armed militia men away from those who were protesting peacefully on the other side of the street. They literally locked their arms together to be for their neighbor. 
for the heart of God, for peace and reconciliation in our world. And that's what the heart of God looks like. And that's what the church should look like around those who are vulnerable and feeling unsafe, that we're locked together, that we show up, and we stand up for peace and shalom in our world, that we say clearly and we live firmly, that we oppose the forces of evil and injustice and oppression in our world wherever they present themselves, that we denounce racial or religious or cultural or cis supremacy, that we reject racism and prejudice and bigotry, homophobia and transphobia and violence of any kind, hatred and malice and sexism and division because of differing political views, that we may disagree, but we do not denigrate each other. For our God is love and our God is for all people. And so we're for all people and we're for our city, for all of it. Amen. So we're in this together. This verse says something incredibly amazing at the end of it. At the end of what we read today, it says, Seek the welfare of the city and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you'll find your welfare. In its shalom, in the holistic flourishing of this community, we'll find our holistic flourishing as well. We are in this together, intertwined, bound up in each other. That as our neighbor flourishes, we flourish as well. That as the vulnerable are made safe, that we are made safe as well. That as creativity and life flourish, we find creative life too. And that as all are welcomed, no matter what, we find ourselves welcomed as well. Study after study sociologically says that in the welfare of our neighbors, we find welfare as well that this crazy idea that God called the exiles to, of shalom seeking, of being for the place where they are, works. There's a famous uh, study from the 70s that shows that the incarceration rate 30 years out is highly correlated to access to preschool, to whether or not you had Head Start or early childhood intervention. And back in those days, Denton was a place of great disparity and opportunity, especially across racial lines. And so in 1970, there were some people from this church and from other churches around town who were for this city, Uh, specifically some amazing, persistent women who got things done. (laughs) And they saw kids from disadvantaged situations who were at risk, and they banded together to start something new. Denton Christian Preschool is what they called it, and it offered low-cost preschool to families in need. It didn't push a theology, but it offered equal opportunity. And from this very first move for justice and equality in our world, for almost 50 years, a group of dedicated professionals and volunteers have taught and fed and loved and nurtured three and four-year-olds here in our community, and Denton is better for it. We flourished because these people were for our city. Other studies show that there's two clear indicators of and predictors of high school dropout rate. One is whether or not you can read by third grade. Two is whether or not you believe that there's an adult in your school who cares about you. And so every year beginning in September, this church and its relationship with Rivera Elementary School just down the road sends mentors through communities and schools to help kids learn to read and to know math, but most importantly, to know that there is someone who is for them, that we are with them and we are for our city. And this year, Crystal and Adrian from our community and others are leading the way, working with Outreach Denton and Big Brothers, Big Sisters to mentor LGBTQ youth so that they, at an incredibly vulnerable time in their lives, will know that we are for them and maybe, just maybe, they'll know that God loves them and is for them too. We're in this community, we're with this community, we are for this community and all that that means because as we seek shalom, the flourishing of our city, we find our flourishing, our shalom, our welfare as well. And it's beautiful. Finding shalom here is about more than shared outcomes and flourishing community, as important as that is. It's something more than that that God wants to speak into our lives. 
that as you seek shalom, you find your shalom because you find your purpose here, what you were built to do. That answer to that question that's inside of us, what do I do here now? Because when who you are and where you are and what you love and what moves your heart and the journey that you've lived and everything that you are intersects the heart of God and the need of your neighbor at the intersection is profound purpose and meaning. Your purpose as an artist, as a teacher, as a server, a construction worker, a student, your purpose as you. See, God has a purpose for you right now, no matter the circumstances or whatever you consider your place of exile. God calls us to be for the place and for the people where God has you. And in that, you'll find that God is for you as well. So there's a, a little verse in our scriptural story. You may have heard it before. You may have seen it on Pinterest because <laughs> it's a powerful verse about purpose. It says, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. That Jeremiah 29 part may sound familiar because that's where we've been today. This is from the very same passage that we've been reading. See, God didn't give that verse to Israel as a refrigerator magnet to stick on their refrigerators. It was spoken to people at a difficult time in their journey. When they weren't sure how to be in the place where God had them, they weren't sure how to make this their home, and God said, dig in. Start with what you are and what you have. Come as a servant and seek the shalom of the place where you are because I have plans for your welfare. And in seeking the shalom of the city, being for the city, Israel would discover God's plans for them. How they would be a part of and discover the hope of God and how they would walk together into a beautiful future. And it is the same for you and for me and for us right now in this city. God has plans for you and for open. And so we're invited to dream big, God-sized dreams here. Because God is for our city. And God is for you. And if God is for us, then what in the world can stand in our way? So let's join our God and just see what amazing plans and purpose and hope and future God works through your life, through our lives, through open to the community of faith in this city. Let's seek the welfare of this city, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we hear your call. In this place, to be people of your peace, be people of your reconciliation, people of your life and of your love. But God, it's, it's hard to imagine how to even begin in that. So we just ask that you open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds, open the doors to us that we might be open to what you're calling us to. Inspire us, God. Show us a place where we can dig in, we can listen up, we can serve and be for the places that you have us. God, thank you for your plans for us, for including us in your mission in this world. Help us be people of your reconciliation for all people in all places, but especially for all people here in our city. God, we love you. Help us to be part of your love for our world. Pray this in your name. Amen.